Uh, my name is Kai Matsuka. Uh, I'm a graduate student at Caltech. Uh, I'm a KISS affiliate, uh, as well as the committee member for the SAS, uh, the Social Activism Speaker Series at the Caltech Y. Um, <clears throat> the Social Activism Speaker Series is a student group that organizes uh, guest seminars, uh, such as this one, uh, that focus on uh, social and uh, political uh, issues uh, that the current society faces. And uh, we would like to challenge students to think beyond the, uh, the science and engineering that we face day to day. <clears throat> so today, uh, we are delighted to host uh, Dr. Scott Pace uh, with us. And Dr. Scott Pace is the Executive Secretary of the National Space Council uh, in the White House. Uh, he was the Director of the uh, Space Policy Institute and a Professor of uh, International Affairs at George uh, Washington University. Uh, he was the Associate Administrator of the NASA uh, <coughs> uh, Program Analysis and Evaluation. And prior to that, uh, he was the Associate Director of the Space and the Aeronautics in the White House Office of the Science and Technology Policy. Um, so he has the, uh, the Bachelor of Science in Physics from the Harvey Mudd College and Master's in Aeronautics and Astronautics uh, from MIT, as well as uh, Technology Policy. And he holds a doctorate uh, in Policy Analysis from the Rand Graduate School. Uh, he is a recipient of uh, numerous awards, uh, so it is really our honor uh, to host uh, Dr. Scott Pace with us today. So please give the Caltech a warm welcome to Dr. Scott Pace. I can see I've stacked the audience with my friends, uh, <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, it's really uh, it's great to be here, and really thank you for the invitation to, uh, to come out. It actually was great timing. I was able to spend uh, this morning at uh, JPL, part of the afternoon at JPL, so I, I got in some, uh, some work today. Um, and also, I uh, uh, have to also say the invitation and the uh, discussion of the itinerary uh, was very helpful uh, because it brought a smile to my, uh, my admin's face because as she's putting the itinerary together, she's saying, Scott, why are you having to look for a woman in a black KISS t-shirt? <laughs> you know, what, you know, how does this, how does this work? I said, it's okay, it's, 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 it's legitimate. Um, and so anyway, so glad to be here. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about, uh, of course, this being the 50th anniversary of Apollo, uh, is to talk about uh, the Apollo program, uh, of course, and then what's actually going, or what we hope to be going on now um, with the Artemis program, which those of you have heard is the sister of Apollo, and there's a whole bunch of other mythology around that. Um, but the 50th anniversary has been, I think, particularly uh, striking in the degree to which it's also come back to public attention. You know, normally, some of these anniversaries are celebrated within the space community, and we all get very excited, and nostalgic, and so forth but it doesn't necessarily break out you know, into, uh, into a sort of larger public awareness. Uh, this year seems to have done that. Um, uh, I don't know about necessarily at all parts of the country, but in Washington, uh, there is a projection, you've probably seen the film of a Saturn V, 394 foot tall, full scale, on the side of the Washington Monument. Um, getting the permit to do that from the National Park Service was a whole other discussion, um, <laughs> but it, it, it succeeded. Um, and, uh, you had half a million people come out at 11 o'clock at night, uh, and it's 90 degrees in Washington, you know, to watch this and cheering at both the launch and the return as if it was really still happening in, in real time. I mean, so uh, the degree to which this was sort of was striking uh, to people and, and, their, and commentary about it, I guess, reminds us once again of what a singular moment that was. But, you know, unfortunately, that sometimes that singular moment also can, can haunt us. That is something that was done once. People think, oh, well, that's the way other space projects have to be done. You know, large national direction, big amounts of money. It all wraps up and then ends. And what comes next? So what I want to do is talk about what happened with Apollo, not on the so much on the technical side, but really on the policy side of it. And some of my ex-students here will see familiar slides. Um, and then talk about what we're trying to do today and how it's similar to Apollo in some ways, but actually very different because the world situation is very different uh, today. So let's see, changing the first slide. 
there's a clicker around here someplace. Spacebar would help. Ah, we have the technology. Okay. So the origins of Apollo, first of all, it wasn't brand new um, with, uh, with John Kennedy. Uh, NASA, which had been created in the aftermath of the, of the Sputnik panic, and NASA itself was cobbled together from an existing agency, the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, um, during the Eisenhower administration chose uh, going to the moon as its kind of long-range goal. Someone in the same spirit that maybe today people would talk about Mars as a long-range goal. NASA in 59 was thinking, you know, what would our really our stretch goal be? We'd like to be able to go to the moon. Uh, not surprisingly, um, uh, Eisenhower was not really a big fan of that. Uh, if you look at the, a lot of other things that Eisenhower was doing at the time in space, they were really on the national security side. ICBMs, reconnaissance satellites, all of that was going on. Uh, but a public program for going to the moon was, was not on his agenda. Uh, NASA, uh, however, announced Apollo, again going to the moon, as its post-Mercury program in mid-1960. Um, and at that point, the goal was to build a three-person spacecraft for both long-duration Earth orbit flights and eventually circumlunar flights, not necessarily going to the surface. Um, but uh, the idea of building a big rocket and getting up to three people in it was cer certainly thought about. And the Mercury program was something that also came out of the Eisenhower administration. Uh, as NASA, looking at this post-Apollo program in mid-1960s, mid you notice that's really just before the election. Uh, in 1960, the election, uh, space was really quite a partisan issue uh, because uh, Kennedy and his running mate, Lyndon Johnson, uh, were very critical of the Eisenhower administration, which they felt wasn't responding sufficiently to the Soviet threat, that there was a missile gap, that we were falling behind, uh, Lyndon Johnson's famous phrase, he was Senate Majority Leader, was, I for one do not want to go to sleep by the light of a communist moon. Um, you know, it's kind of to, you know, give you a sense of the tenor of the times. Kennedy said, you know, the space stuff is really important, we're going to get the country moving again. Eisenhower is that, you know, kind of sleeping grandfather character. Again, people had no idea what Eisenhower was really doing. But, you know, we're going to get the country moving again, and that we're going to uh, have a National Space Council, and we're going to energize it. It already existed under Eisenhower, frankly, but we're going to energize it by having Lyndon Johnson, the vice president, uh, be the chair of it, and we're going to elevate uh, that policymaking process. Uh, before the election, uh, NASA began preliminary planning, again, for thinking about what a lunar landing might be. Eisenhower did get briefed on it, and he reacted quite negatively. Uh, that's an understatement. It was like, you know, you guys are crazy. Kennedy was not particularly uh, an enthusiast uh, about space as well. Uh, the transition team that came in after the uh, election in November uh, cautioned Kennedy about uh, an emphasis on human spaceflight. Dangerous, unknown, who knows what it costs. We've got lots of other things to be worrying about. Now, Kennedy actually saw space not so much as an area of competition, but as an area of potential common interest with the Soviet Union and a potential area for cooperation. And again, for many of those political science types, not surprisingly, the U.S. perceived itself as the inferior power in this point because the Soviets had had quite a lead in that, so hey, cooperating with them, maybe that's in our, our interest. Uh, now, space cooperation was mentioned in both Kennedy's inaugural address and, and first State of the Union address, but he deferred decisions on any future space program. The only thing he really gave a go-to uh, was the capability of having larger, more powerful rockets because you know, he knew that whatever we did, we'd need bigger rockets than we had at the time, uh, meaning things like uh, the uh, the Jupiter C rocket or the Redstone vehicles, which are really pretty modest. They're really almost intermediate range ballistic missiles. The Atlas, which is really the first major ICBM level capability, uh, had just, just been fielded uh, at this time. So needing a bigger rocket, got that. Not really sure what I'm going to use it for, but we'll probably need it, so uh, put that in the budget. Now, between the time he was elected, remember Sputnik happens in 1957, is that shock for the Eisenhower administration. Major space shock for the Kennedy administration is Yuri Gagarin goes up. So it's one thing to put up a little metal ball uh, going around, one thing to put up, you know, uh, some dogs. Um, but uh, actually a human being uh, goes up and comes back uh, April 12, 1961. Again, a major, major shock. Now, the shock was twofold. One, uh, because this represented a level of technical capability which directly translated into perceptions of ICBM capability. If you can put a man up in orbit and bring him down to a particular location, that is, putting a payload up, controlling it, bringing it down in a precision way, well, that could be a nuclear weapon, too. So that was, you know, a dual-use dual technology perception. The other thing about it was it was also a symbol of 
you know, post-World War II Soviet economic and technical capability, which was very attractive to the din, then decolonializing third world. There are many countries in Africa and Asia are just coming out from under the breakup of the British Empire, breaking up the French and, and German empires, and these countries are going like, which way should we go? And the Soviet Union is going, look at us, we do all this great stuff, we're the future. Uh, you know, the uh, actual play out of that and what happened to the Soviet Union, that was still far in the future. In 1960, 61, you could still think, oh, maybe this uh, communism stuff will work out and it's going to be good for us. So you can probably see an echo of that today and the cars are available to civil servants in India. India went off toward the Soviet model and uh, they still have the cars to prove it. Um, but, sorry, what's that mean? Um, but the contest, the geopolitical reason uh, for this was that we were trying, that it was really for influence in the developing world as part of the larger contest against Soviet communism. So political perceptions, psychological perceptions are, are a big part of this. Uh, John F. Kennedy decided that the U.S. really had to enter and really win this race. Now, this, there's an area of historical argument because there is, in fact, no real hard evidence on either side, but lots of speculation that this decision was also influenced by the Bay of Pigs fiasco. This was the unsuccessful attempt of, uh, of uh, Cuban exiles to reinvade Cuba and, and take down the Castro government, which had just, just come to power in the revolution. Um, whole separate longer story, but this happened in April 17th through 20th. Again, month of April is a bad month here for Kennedy. Um, not clear how much influence that had on the particular decision, but it really set this context of things are going bad. The U.S. is looking bad. It not only is being bested in uh, space activities that are very symbolic and visible, uh, we're also taking hits uh, really literally 90 miles from our shore, uh, closer to home. So Kennedy lays out some requirements. Um, he says, look, do we have a chance of beating the Soviets uh, by putting a laboratory in space, trip around the room, moon, a rocket to go to the moon, come back with a manager, any space program which promises dramatic results in which we could win. So that spelled out in this memo here to the Vice President, April 20th, 1961. Um, saying, you know, that statement at the beginning, how much would this cost, are we working 24 hours a day, building large boosters, we should put an emphasis on chemical, nuclear, liquid fuel, combination of these things, are we making the maximum effort, achieving necessary results, push, 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 you know, putting this on the Vice President. This, this memo and asking the question in this way is really the political rationale for why you get a moon program. It's not because we want to explore the stars and establish humanity and all that kind of stuff. This is a political question that Kennedy has. He has a political problem. He's asking the political question. And the answer that comes back uh, is largely that, yes, we could do a lot of these other things, but it's not clear that the Soviets wouldn't beat us at many of those other things because they already have quite a lead. Instead, if we choose a lunar landing, um, that requires, that is such a dramatic difference that both the Soviets and ourselves are in the same boat. That is, neither of us has the capability to do this because we would require a new and larger generation of launch vehicle than either side had. So if you had talked about building a space station or even sending somebody around the moon, trip down, around and come back, if you started down that path, given where the Russians were, they could probably do that. Uh, and might truly beat you. But if you're starting with something that was so dramatically hard, it was an even match. Now, part of the arrogance, if you will, of that time was uh, in terms of building large boosters, one of the experts, of course, was Dr. Werner von Braun. Okay, who came over after World War II, Operation Paperclip, and you can read all that with his uh, team from Penamunde. And von Braun's answer was, we need a really large rocket to do this. I can deliver a really large rocket and I can do it better than anybody in the world. You've got me, they don't, we can win this. Um, <laughs> you know, you've got to imagine, you got to admire it. Okay, and uh, so, I love the phrase, yes. we have an excellent chance of beating the Soviets to the first landing of a crew on the moon. Now, the political rationale provided uh, by James Webb, uh, who had been a budget official under Truman, of all things, um, and Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara in uh, May, remember we went from you know, April 12th, we're now less than a month later, May 8th, uh, says, look, it's men, not merely machines, that capture the imagination of the world. Large-scale space projects aimed at enhancing national prestige 
are part of the battle along the fluid front of the Cold War. So this kind of sort of emotional uh, symbolism. Now this was long before we had things like you know, spirit and opportunity around Mars. You know, some people have heard the phrase, uh, you know, nobody gives parades for robots. Um, but we probably would these days um, if, we, if we think about some of the things that have come out of this lab. But at this time, no. It was really human beings were the thing that, that captured that imagination. Uh, and Kennedy's speech then, uh, less than a, a little over a month later, May 25th, before Congress, uh, famous phrase, now is the time to take longer strides, time to take a great new American enterprise, time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement. This nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before the decade is out, landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. So there's a mission statement basically in a sentence. But how do you get there? Again, nobody knew. There were three schools of thought uh, about how to do that. One was build a uh, really big rocket, go to moon, land on moon with big, big rocket, launch, come back. Um, that was a rocket that would make the Saturn V look small. Um, that was pretty much dismissed because you just couldn't build something quite that big. The next one was rendezvous your parts and components in Earth orbit, take really big rocket to the moon, land on the moon, come back in Earth orbit. This was favored by Von Braun and the teams at Marshall uh, Hunt Space Flight Center in Alabama because use your really big rocket. If anything went wrong, you're still in Earth orbit, so you can come home. So the sense of doing this closer to home was felt to be less risky. The one that was eventually chosen, lunar orbit rendezvous, was launch the rocket, go to lunar orbit, take a smaller vehicle, have it go down to the moon, then come back up, dock, and then come home. Uh, turned out to be the winning entry. Now, this was not foreordained. There is a, a dramatic and large internal debate within NASA. Uh, this guy, uh, uh, Professor John Hobolt, uh, was an engineer at Langley Research Center, and he was an advocate of this lunar orbit rendezvous approach. Uh, wrote letter really directly uh, to Webb, and um, he was certainly in the minority uh, on this position. And what he really demonstrated, and you can see sort of breaking out on the chalkboard a bit, was he says all of this is about mass. The more mass that you have to shove to the moon and then haul it back, the worse off you're going to, you want to be. You want to be as mass efficient as possible, meaning that you want to be able to basically take that large Saturn V that was on the Washington Monument and essentially burn it down so the only thing that comes back you know, for the moon is that little capsule on the end. Not taking everything to the moon and then having everything come back. Uh, that was really, that mass conservation was really the key insight that he had. Now, that didn't mean it was a done deal because there's all kinds of sub-problems. Rendezvous and docking, communication, what happens if something goes wrong, what are your abort options, all of those things, all quite serious. But those were then bounded sub-problems that emerged after you had sort of the strategic direction of doing lunar orbit rendezvous. And what we then spent much of the Gemini program doing was proving out a lot of those capabilities that would be necessary for Apollo. So things like going out on EVA spacewalk, uh, things like uh, doing automated rendezvous and docking, having multiple ships operating near to each other. So if you think of the first program, Mercury, as going human goes up, human comes back, can they survive? The next program, Gemini, was about building up all the tools and parts and skills necessary to make this happen, which then leads into Apollo. So you don't just start a mission and go, I'm going to put, put it all together and it's going to work the first time. It's really you're incrementally training your organization through a series of phases to get to a point where you're then capable of executing a very, very ambitious effort. It is not just humans or their machines that go to the moon, it's really entire organizations. Again, you can think of JPL and how it's organized, trained, and equipped to put things on Mars and other planets. That didn't just happen overnight. It's built incrementally over a series of tests and experiences. This internal NASA debate, um, you know, over uh, lunar orbit rendezvous uh, broke out into the administration itself. Uh, the White House Science Office, uh, uh, George Kisiakowski, the science advisor, uh, objected to it. Uh, frankly, being good, arrogant scientists, they didn't trust NASA's analysis. Uh, they go, they wanted to develop various capabilities in Earth orbit uh, for national security positions. Uh, again, remember this is a time when the National Reconnaissance Office and the Corona Program, the early reconnaissance capabilities, were all still classified and, and not, not really certainly known to the general public. And the science advisors like, look, we got a lot of other things we need to be doing. Uh, Earth orbit rendezvous develops a lot of capacities in Earth orbit. That's what we ought to be doing. Lunar orbit rendezvous doesn't really do a lot, you know, for us. And they went back and forth. And, 
yelling back and forth at NASA and so forth. Now, Webb and the science advisor, uh, uh, Jerome, I'm sorry, I said Kissy Kelsey, I'm sorry, Jerome Wisner, um, argued uh, as Kennedy toured a uh, facility plant in Huntsville in September of that year. I mean, really, they're walking along and the reporters are behind him and, you know, Wisner and Webb are arguing back and forth with each other, with Kennedy going, oh, what are these guys doing? Uh, Cuban Missile Crisis happens in October. Okay, so, you know, I'm going to accept NASA's choice because I have other things I've got to do. Uh, it was not something that he was going to, you know, wade into. I either trust the agency head I put in charge of it or I don't. So, you know, told Webb, your call. Now, this doesn't mean he gave Webb a carte blanche. In fact, there are, again, a series of debates about differing views on what the U.S. goals were supposed to be. Uh, in November of 1962, uh, next year, uh, you have this, uh, there's a YouTube link at the bottom, it's a great recording, where Kennedy is saying, look, it's important for political reasons, international political reasons, everything we do ought to be really tied to getting to the moon before the Russians. I'm not that interested in space. I've got problems <laughs> elsewhere. I, I need you to help me with my geopolitical issues. Webb uh, is saying, look, the objective of our national space program has become preeminent in all important aspects. The manned lunar landing program, although of highest national priority, will not by itself create the preeminent position we seek. And so you hear Webb on this tape talking about, uh, if anybody wants to know the technology, it was dictabelts, if anybody's really into ancient technology, uh, that they were going to uh, have a wide program, including science and technology development and education. So Webb had a view of sort of space America, where space goes out and tries to, it goes out and really develops a broader economy and the social structure of the country, so the country overall is stronger and more capable. Kennedy is much more narrowly focused, and on the, on the tape you hear this argument going back and forth, where Kennedy is going, no, 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 this is, this is the only important thing, and you hear Webb going, it's among the most important things. <laughs> and you're going, man, this guy has a lot of guts, <laughs> you know, to be, you know, arguing with the president that way. And, um, you know, by October of 63, um, Kennedy had, had earlier written a, a, a cooperative proposal, and he ordered a sweeping review of the total U.S. space program. So it wasn't as if Kennedy drops the challenge and then puts on the blinders and goes full speed ahead. He's always looking like, is there something else we could do? Is there something else we could do? Um, and during this review, slowing down or even canceling Apollo was considered by some of JFK's advisors at least relaxing that whole end of the decade thing, you know, which was driving a lot of the budget. If you look at the budget uh, ramp up in that period, uh, fiscal year 1964 is really striking because in that year, 4.4% of the federal budget was spent on NASA. That was 1.1% of the GDP of the country. That will never happen again, okay? <laughs> People fantasize about it, that will never happen again, okay? But what you're doing by that level of spending okay, that peak, is you're buying time. You're, you're shoving a whole bunch of programs into operation all at once. You're building rockets, you're building launch sites, control centers. You are doing simultaneous development of a whole bunch of things in parallel because what you're doing is you're buying schedule. If schedule was not such an issue, you could stretch those things out more sequentially, your total cost might go up, your schedule would slip out. So cost, schedule, performance, all these things are fungible and tradable things as those of you who do project management know. So what we were doing with schedule is pulling it forward, and that's why we're getting that kind of peak funding. Now, McNamara and the DOD were consistent in their view that this Apollo thing, this doesn't have any value for us. Uh, thank you very much. We have our budget. Go forth. Great. Uh, you know, we're not going to claim anything. Now, of course, there were military and technical overlaps, but in terms of uh, DOD signing up for funding a large portion of it, you know, no. Now, the Bureau of the Budget, predecessor to OMB, which was managing the review, concluded that in the absence of clear changes in technical or international situation, the only basis for backing off from the end of, end of decade goal was really fiscal, um, but that the cost of the program could be accommodated in the projected budgets. Now, one of the things you also have to know about this period of time is the availability of discretionary spending was much, much higher. This is long before entitlement spending and interest largely dominated uh, the, uh, the budget. So you could do these kind of large swings in the federal budget because this is really qu quite before the Johnson administration uh, programs come in, before Social Security, which was already was established, was expanding, but before Medicare, Medicaid, other kinds of things, sort of fixed entitlements on the budget went up. 
So the Bureau of the Budget, in fact, was correct. Yes, it was massive. Yes, it was, it was, it was pressing, and they didn't want to have to sustain it for a long time. But there was room in the discretionary budget to do that because of the structure of the budget at that time. You could not do, probably do that today. Um, you're, you're, you would have to go after entitlements. You'd have to go after debt in ways that probably be politically unfeasible. So Kennedy was assassinated in November of uh, 63 before the results of the review hit his desk. Maybe he heard some preliminary conclusions, but um, you know, really didn't get a chance, and to, therefore it's been a subject of speculation as to what would have happened if Kennedy lived. You know, would we have backed off of that, that, that date? Uh, would we have uh, pursued more cooperation with the Soviets? Uh, all of those are somewhat unanswered questions. Um, the, for the side that says we would have kept going, uh, really, really almost a few weeks really before his death, in November of 16th of 63, uh, he was briefed on the Apollo plans, and most importantly, he went down and was actually got a chance to kind of see the buildings, uh, the construction of the first Saturn I booster uh, that was being prepared for launch in December. And this thing was just massive. I mean, again, compared to other rockets at the time. And it, this is sort of when I think it kind of viscerally hit him as to the size and scope of what was going on and really how impressive you know, this was. And he came away from this very enthusiastic, um, but again, less than a week later, uh, he was dead. Now, as the Apollo program went on, it had other hits to it. Uh, in 1967, there was the famous Apollo 1 fire, uh, where um, uh, Grissom, White, and Chaffee uh, were killed on the pad. Uh, this really stopped the program for about a year, which was probably a good thing, because it meant that people went back and looked over every safety aspect uh, of the program. Uh, and, um, you know, if this you know, it's one of these things, it's, it's hard to do counterfactual history, um, but this thing certainly was, was a shock to the system in a way that Challenger or Columbia certainly it were, losses were shocks to us, um, but it uh, arguably uh, made some of the changes, forced the changes for success. Now this is one of my favorite international, car, international charts. Um, everybody's kind of familiar with uh, the picture of Earthrise, and, uh, and sort of Apollo 8 and one of the few positive things from 1968. Uh, and so this picture came up and Lyndon Johnson was very impressed by it. And he was so impressed that he ordered NASA to send it to all the nations of the world. NASA, being the literal engineers that they were, <laughs> sent it to every nation of the world, including North Vietnam. <laughs> so several months later, through the East Berlin Embassy of North Vietnam came a thank you card in French to the president saying, thank you for the photo of the moon. Uh, you know, your excellency, uh, you know, signed Ho Chi Minh. And uh, so I gave that, this was in the NASA archives, so I made a PDF of it and, you know, and put it on, put it on here. Uh, but I used this in a, in a lecture I gave at the Vietnamese Institute of Physics back in 2005. They were having a, um, a centenary of Einstein's 1905, you know, photoelectric paper. And um, I was talking about GPS and general relativity, you know, and well, how we use it. But I ended with this uh, chart to make the point that space is something that makes us, you know, lift up our eyes, lift up, you know, look beyond. And so even during a time of conflict, you know, something, you know, like this, this kind of can occur. Um, you can see in uh, papers um, uh, in Tehran when uh, the Mars landings occur, okay, front page coverage, okay, in Tehran of you know, what's been done. When Apollo uh, landed on the moon, um, of course the whole world was, uh, was struck by it. Um, but when they came back uh, from this and went on their world tour, the uh, three of them, the common phrase that they heard all the time was not what you Americans did it, but we did it. It was considered something of a human achievement, you know, a group achievement. And, uh, also, as a, as a trivia event, if you remember the Apollo uh, 11 uh, logo, the eagle landing on the moon, you know, with the olive branch, one of the things you'll notice at Neil Armstrong's insistence that the name of the crew is not present. Every other mission patch, shuttle patch, Apollo patch is the name of the crew, okay? But Neil wanted to make the point that this was something, there's a whole team behind this. So the Apollo 11 patch for the first lunar landing has no names, it simply, it simply speaks for itself. To give you a sense, uh, again, uh, talking about the, you know, comparing to the Washington Monument, uh, there's a Saturn V. Uh, just to the side, uh, that uh, dart-shaped looking thing is the, was the uh, Soviet 
uh, vehicle, uh, the Nova, or whatever, N1 that they might call it. Um, and uh, it blew up several times. It never really succeeded in, uh, in getting to orbit, but you can see roughly the same kind of scale. Uh, if you look next to it, uh, there's a Skylab uh, vehicle that was that Saturn V that was converted and used. And you realize what they started with were things like Mercury Redstone, Mercury Atlas. So if you think back to the 1961 sort of decisions about we need to build bigger rockets, this is what they had, this is what they knew you know, they needed uh, in terms of a rather dramatic change. And for scale, of course, we have uh, the shuttle. Uh, one of the major technical achievements uh, of this was flying some of the, in an operational form, from the, some of the first integrated circuit ships, Fairchild Semiconductor. Uh, so these things came out of a laboratory uh, and, uh, and flew. The Apollo guidance computers, there was two for every mission, one in the command module, one in the lunar module. Uh, 4K of word, 4K, RAM of 4K, yay. Uh, ROM, 32K, yay. Um, and the commands are entered as nouns, program something, a verb and a noun. Like here, here's a verb, do, do X, have it operate on Y. Um, and uh, the, uh, the program, there are actually people who built simulations of this, both online and as well as made up other mocks. It's, it's really quite, quite fascinating. There's a wonderful book called Digital Apollo uh, by my colleague David Mendel from MIT if anybody wants to sort of uh, read the history of this sort of thing. Um, the famous 1201 alarm, how many people have heard of that? All right, there's a crowd, yay. Okay, so this is with uh, buffer overflow uh, occurring on the vehicle. Nobody really knew what that was as they're coming in and landing. Uh, there, it's getting saturated, and so it was dumping excess data that it didn't need, but it was programmed in such a resilient way that it was dumping the lower priority data. It was still preserving all the stuff it really needed to do, it was getting rid of the stuff that didn't matter. There was a 25-year-old guy in the back room named Jack Garman who had a list of every alarm that was ever possible or gonna happen. And so when, uh, when Neil is in final approach and they call out 1201, what is this? Is this, because nobody knew, flight controller Chris Kraft didn't know, you know Steve Bales' guidance didn't know, but quickly goes back to this back room where this kid Jack has got the list and he, called, he recognizes what it is had seen it in a sim, on the list, flight, we're go on that, fine, goes back up, moving on. That's not just a testament to some obsessive compulsiveness of you know, one young engineer. What it also represents is the degree of trust that stretched from that back room out to the moon. There's nobody asking, you know, give me another opinion, tell, ask your supervisor, you know, do we have a peer review of this? No, 1201 alarm. Go or go, go, boom, keep going, land. Okay, this is an organization that is now organized, trained, and equipped to be able to land on the moon, not only because of the technical knowledge, but also because of the management structure and the quality and degree of trust that was then built in after years and years and years of, of sims and development and flight test. And a lot of people ask, you know, was this really real? I mean, first of all, did we really land on the moon? I hope there's nobody here who asks that. <laughs> uh, please leave. I'll explain it to you later. Um, but there are people who go, really, was it, was it real? Because at the time Kennedy made the decision to go to the moon, the U.S. really didn't know whether the Soviet Union actually had a lunar landing program. Really? In fact, part of the reason we made the decision to go to the moon is because we thought that it would be really hard and they'd have to gin up one too. So it wasn't like we knew there was a lunar landing program and we're now gonna compete against them. It's because we created the race in order to change the terms of the game. Um, and the program, in fact, as we knew later, wasn't really approved in the Soviet Union until 1964. So two years you know, then go by. Uh, the chief designer who did Sputnik and early launches, the uh, old Samoyorka number seven, uh, Sergei Korolev, of course, died on an operating table in 1966, which took out just really a major, major leader uh, in the Soviet program. And there was a rival circumlunar robotic program that came close to success. The Soviets built a lunar lander, they trained cosmonauts on the moon, uh, but the N-1 rocket, the big thing on the right, okay, failed. Four launch attempts, four failures. The lander, however, which would have carried one cosmonaut, we think maybe it would have been Alexei Leonov, who did the first space, down to the lunar surface and back, okay, actually flew, test, was test flown in Earth orbit four times, one up and on expendable. Uh, so that part of the vehicle did flow, fly. We really didn't quite know a lot about it, certainly in the unclassified literature. It was actually uh, observed uh, by one of my uh, 
professors at MIT, people might know Ed Crawley, um, aeronautics department. Anyway, he was on a tour just as, as the Soviet Union was kind of disintegrating. 1989 and kind of came through this back building and saw this big thing and goes, what's that? Well, that's our lunar lander. Really? Can I take a picture? You know, and that's the first time it hit the Western press that there in fact was this thing uh, that was out there. Uh, two years, of course, after the last Apollo mission, the Soviet lunar program was canceled. Uh, but as I said, the, the lander was uh, first photographed by handheld camera, uh, you know, in, in Russia, not until 1989. Now, NASA had a whole bunch of post-Apollo, you know, ambitions. And it's really kind of maybe depressing uh, if you sort of look at this, um, but it's instructive. Because if you look at manned systems, some of the things they were thinking about doing after Apollo happened. You know, 1981, you know, initial Mars expedition, you know, yeah. Okay, lunar surface base in 78, eh, maybe 83 if things go badly. Uh, you know, space station, Earth orbit in the late 70s. You make an argument that was sort of Skylab. Now, in the middle, things like Earth to orbit, space transportation system, uh, shuttle at worst case was maybe going to fly in 77, it flew in 81. Um, nuclear orbit transfer stage never happened. Space tug arguably was put out of commission as people built upper stages separately for their launch vehicles, but we sort of did this. Now, the scientific missions, things like large orbiting observatory, okay, Hubble, okay. Um, looking at, uh, you know, high resolution mapping of Mars, uh, outer planet tours, so remember, people remember Mar Mariner, Jupiter, Saturn, later became famous programs. So the scientific missions were happening, and interestingly enough, the applications programs, so the first like Landsat programs, direct broadcast TV. Direct broadcast TV, for a lot of my early years, was a total science fiction thing. It was kind of like, oh yeah, satellite directly to your house, are you kidding? You know, you know what kind of antenna you would need for that? Um, but and, and really was science fiction for a long time. Of course, now DirecTV, everybody has one. It's, it's considered routine. But again, this, this also was happening. Navigation control, GPS. First GPS satellite, Nav Navstar 1, went up in 1974. It was still experimental during the first Gulf War. It really didn't go operational till, till after that. Uh, so it went over a long multi-decade period. But what you see is the practical application stuff happened. A lot of the science stuff happened, you know, renamed. A little bit of the shuttle transportation system happened because you got to have this before you do that because if you have this and don't have that, it's kind of hard. And so these more sort of ambitious things didn't happen, in part, I would argue, because there wasn't really a political rationale for it. You can make practical discussions here. You can say, well, decadal surveys and we spend a bit, bit of money on science, so whatever fits in the science priority. But things like this, you know, which are really major, you have to have a geopolitical or some other overarching reason to do it, as opposed to you're doing it for fun. Um, I make an, a number of arguments, some of my students can attest, that pretty much every major uh, human spaceflight program that we've done, with two exceptions, uh, decisions that have been taken, have been done for geopolitical reasons. Uh, the uh, Apollo program itself, of course. Uh, the Apollo-Soyuz test mission, the first docking between US and Soviet spacecraft, 1975 came out of a summit meeting between Nixon and Brezhnev in 72, symbolizing detente. Uh, organizing the space station program as part of an anti-Soviet coalition uh, by Reagan. Uh, bringing the Russians into the space station program during the Clinton administration in order to symbolize a post-Soviet relationship. These were sort of like major kinds of turning points. Where there was not a, um, uh, a geopolitical aspect to it, the shuttle decision by Nixon in 1972 was done predominantly for domestic reasons. There was virtually no international aspect to it. The Obama administration's cancellation of the Constellation program and the journey to Mars effort was again very domestically oriented and there wasn't any, uh, unfortunately, international consultation on that part. It was really done in, in a domestic context. So uh, major decisions do happen without international stuff, but international stuff tends to be very important uh, for the programs that actually get funded and wind up succeeding. Shuttle succeeded. Uh, after a fashion, uh, but it was really almost a decision to uh, not end human spaceflight rather than a decision as to what were you going to do with it and where were you going to go. Separate lecture. We did build um, uh, the International Space Station. Again, as I said, decision by Reagan went through all kinds of uh, turmoil, uh, and it turned from being a U.S. program with some international parts stuck on it 
to being really a truly international partnership. Uh, in the aftermath of the redesign effort in early 92, uh, we brought the Russians in, and you'll see, so you'll see things in here like Russian components at the center, we do the power, they do the propulsion. You can see a little Japanese module on the side, a shuttle up here. This picture was taken uh, by a, uh, uh, a Soyuz vehicle, a little credit down on the side that had been backed off. Uh, so you get a picture of the shuttle actually docked with the whole vehicle. Uh, this thing is about a million pounds. You know, and the idea that we're gonna build another million pound facility like this, probably not. Uh, so it's going to end at some point. Uh, the first modules were put up there. It was a, actually a Russian core module in 1998. Uh, it in turn was based off of a canceled Mir-2 uh, program. Uh, so there's kind of some end of life issues uh, going on with it. We don't know quite what it is. People think it can probably do survive to 2028, maybe a little bit longer. But in the lifetime of aerospace projects, which take like decade to do, we're in the latter half. Uh, and a latter third or less. Uh, so the time really is now to think about what are we going to be doing next, not only because we like this capability of being able to send astronauts up and training and we like to do science and all that, but also what's been created by the space station has been an international partnership. So we have relations among thousands of people worldwide, uh, including our Russian colleagues who we like and respect and work with very well, government notwithstanding, but we look and work with our Japanese or Canadian or European counterparts. The only thing sort of comparable to this probably is something like CERN um, and in terms of an international partnership or possibly maybe the F-35 uh, you know, fighter program is an international kind of, in terms of complexity, cost, range, technologies that, that go on. Uh, this is pretty much you know, in a class by itself in terms of major scientific achievement. And because of its symbolism like this, okay, there's a political aspect to it, whereas we don't want that partnership to go away. And we want to figure out how we can keep, keep doing it. Um, during the Obama administration, we had uh, proposals for how to eventually go to Mars. One of the things you'll notice, though, is there really isn't much happening on the lunar surface. Um, it's really kind of operating around Mars, maybe some robots on the surface, then more robots going out here. Uh, the sequence of operating near Earth, using commercial systems, proving stuff around the moon and then eventually moving toward Earth independent. All that conceptually was there, but there really wasn't an effort uh, to actually return to the surface. So uh, one of the problems with that uh, and that focus on Mars was that a lot of other countries and companies didn't really feel there was a, a place for them. Uh, I had heads of uh, a, n a number of space agencies ask me if the U.S. was really serious about international space cooperation. And they were asking me this around 2010 when the policy came out. And of course, I'm at university and I'm like, I'm an academic, what do I know? Um, you know, I say, well, sure, and of course we do. And the answer is, well, we're skeptical. I said, well, why do you say that? I said, well, because you chose a goal, going to Mars, that you know we can't do. So maybe you want to work with the Russians, but we don't think you want to work with us, you know, maybe a smaller space agency. And as a result, you saw other countries starting to really drift away from us. Uh, in 2011, um, there was a program called ExoMars that we were working with the, with the uh, Europeans on their top scientific priority, which was a Mars sample return, um, which uh, we abandoned and we told the Europeans to go talk to the Russians about a launch vehicle because we weren't going to help them. And so in both the human side and the robotic side, you could see a kind of a drifting away. So uh, I became rather opposed uh, to the Mars program, not because I didn't like Mars, but because I saw it as being geopolitically harmful to the U.S. It was harming our alliances, it was weakening our alliances, because we weren't providing people with an on-ramp or a way to engage uh, with us. Uh, and so uh, coming in, uh, this administration, and by the way, the rest of the 2010 space policy is actually perfectly fine. The section on exploration I really disagreed with, and some other bits and parts, but you know, space policy is not terribly a partisan issue. It tends to, tends to be very, very stable across long periods in terms of basic principles. Uh, but here, uh, Space Policy Directive 1, so the first thing the Space Council did as it was resurrected in the Trump administration, um, was to try to correct what I saw as an error, and my colleagues agreed, and uh, we direct that NASA should lead an innovative and sustainable program of exploration with commercial and international partners, not going by ourselves, to enable human expansion across the solar system and to bring back to Earth new knowledge and opportunities. Beginning with missions beyond low Earth orbit, the U.S. will lead return of humans to the moon 
for long-term exploration utilization, followed by human missions to Mars and other destinations. So basically putting it in a sequence, doesn't have a timeline on there, okay, which would drive you on budget. Um, as we had said in the Bush 43 administration, it's a journey, not a race, but like go in that direction, go in this sequence, and different from the past, talking more about utilization, talking more about commercial and international partners. Because the geopolitical environment had changed from Apollo, Apollo was all about, look what I can do by myself. You know, aren't I cool? Come hang with me. Whereas today, we have a much more globalized space environment, a much more democratized environment. Many more countries are capable of going in space. Many more uh, individual companies are capable of operating in space. So the barriers to entry are much lower than they were. Sometimes that presents problems with things like missile proliferation, uh, but other times space technologies have spread more widely. So leadership today is not about just demonstrating what I can do by myself, but what I can get other people to want to do with me. How do I get other people to join me and want to be part of my team? And to do that, you have to have exploration efforts that provide hooks for other people to participate at whatever level they're capable of. Sometimes it's building a large habitation module or making a lander. Other times it might be just a small package experiment that rides along. Uh, so providing a way for people to be able to participate is the way in this environment you shape and bring other people to be part of you and, and be supportive of you and your interests as opposed to feeling that they're being pushed away from you. Uh, so the NASA charge on, on going, to the, going to the moon, this SPD-1 certainly talked about that. And what the vice president then did as we were going through the budget process was saying, OK, so when are we going to sort of land on the moon? And the default at that point was 2028, at which point he goes, try 2024. And the point of that, uh, and, and, a, and a bit of a, a shock to the system, was twofold. One, uh, as Administrator Bridenstine has said, is says, you know, yes, we have technical problems, yes, we have budget problems, but the biggest problem we have is political risk. As you try to do major programs across multiple administrations and across multiple Congresses, the more you do, the more chances there are of somebody deciding to change direction or do something else. And the problem with that, of course, in addition to instability in general, um, is that it also means that the bureaucracy doesn't always fully invest itself. It goes, you know, they're going to change. Something else will happen. You know, let's, let's not get our, our hearts too set on this because something else will change. If you pull a goal in, even if it's really ambitious and difficult, but still possible to do, as Apollo was, that the bureaucracy goes, oh, I might actually be accountable for this point. If you have a Mars program that it doesn't intend to land till say, 2033 or 2040, you can go home at 3 on, on Fridays, right? W what difference does it make, right? But if your goal is much closer and you're accountable for it within your tenure, there's much more of a focus. And so that's that part of bureaucratic management, political risk management, with an assessment of what was technically possible, where the budgets might be, was part of the reason, big part of the reason for pulling that, that forward. Uh, and the Vice President used the line about NASA will use all means necessary. And this is um, a way of referring uh, to the need to using both our commercial and international partners that it is, again, not Apollo in the sense of the government owning and running all these things, because it often it can't. Uh, the talent in this country is spread over a much wider area. And so being open to using commercial partnerships, buying services, whatever can be done to advance a goal, it's really, it's America that is doing this. It is not NASA that is doing this. We want NASA to be the exploration agency, not necessarily the operating agency. The Artemis program, as I mentioned, as uh, 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 named by uh, the administrator, is this twin sister of Apollo. Um, we also, uh, there is a decision here to go where Apollo did not go, which is the South Pole of the Moon. Uh, it takes a little bit more Delta V to get down there. Um, but uh, more importantly, uh, this is a region where, subsequent to Apollo, uh, we've discovered large amounts of excess hydrogen, which we believe is encased in, in ice. We don't really know what the format of that is. is it, is it really water ice? Is it just dirty snowballs? Is it mixed with dirt and dust? What is that really like? We, characterization of the volatiles is one of the early scientific things we have to know. Depending on what that characterization is, we can think about utilization, which is cracking water and into hydrogen and oxygen, using it to breathe, using it for fuel, 
not having to haul it up from Earth. Uh, obviously, from the, in the initial stages, hauling from Earth is all you're going to be able to do. But if you're going to be sustainable in the long term, you need to be able to live off the land and use local resources to the extent possible. So again, something where this is a bit different in conceptualization than Apollo. The program divides into two phases. The first phase is, is the one of sort of a shock to the system and getting up and running by 2024 to do a human landing, probably a two-person uh, lander uh, preceded by some robotic landers to pre place uh, supplies and materials. Um, and then in the second phase, it's establishing more of a, of a long-term presence. What you first want to do is build an organization that's capable of doing deep space exploration and then behind that spear point, then fill in uh, with bringing in other people for long-term things like power and water and other partners who can go with you. So the phase one period uh, for getting to the lunar surface by 2024, uh, first human spacecraft uh, to the moon uh, is uh, not gonna have people in it. It's gonna be an unmanned test flight uh, going around doing a kind of an Apollo 8-like journey. Uh, when the Vice President was down at Kennedy on uh, July 20th for the Apollo anniversary. Uh, that was uh, also a time to announce that the Orion capsule to go there was capsule complete. It doesn't mean it was ready to fly, it means it had been completed and assembled and was ready to go for testing. And as soon as we've been finished testing uh, in some of the uh, uh, thermal vac chambers in, in Ohio, uh, then we'll bring it back down and made it to the vehicle. And we're looking like, you know, 2021. We're trying to pull it back into 20. Uh, if we can, but uh, uh, that's really a problem for the Space Launch System. That's not so much a problem with Orion. Uh, the second mission over that is to then send humans up around, again, doing an Apollo 8 kind of loop around the moon. Uh, we've already uh, put the purchase for power and propulsion element, uh, solar propulsion element, which would be in lunar orbit. Uh, that, combined with a small habitation module and the life support systems on Orion, uh, basically gives us a small gateway uh, in high lunar orbit, pretty high up in the, in the gravity well. I'll show you a photograph of that, a uh, diagram of that in a minute. Um, and then the third mission um, is get a crewed mission to the gateway and use a lander to get to the surface that you have hopefully already developed, demonstrated earlier in robotic mode. Uh, so unlike, uh, say, the Apollo missions, this is not going to an unprepared site with totally everything just on your back. Um, the somewhat possibly flippant way I refer to it as the difference between backpacking in the Sierra Nevadas and backpacking in Switzerland. In Sierra Nevadas, you carry everything with you. Those of you who are smiling know that in Switzerland, you stroll from hut to hut, and uh, there's usually red wine at the end and some raclette, mm -hmm. and then move on to the next hut. Um, you know, you have things pre in place. Uh, you don't, you don't take, take chances. Um, but what that implies is uh, the uh, uh, very, very strong robotic program, which is based on the Science Mission Directorate. Uh, so the Science Mission Directorate at NASA is buying uh, a number of options on commercial uh, lunar payload delivery services uh, that then scale up to large scale landers uh, that we can then, so early shots on goal, to use a hockey phrase, uh, are really coming out of the science and robotic community side. Uh, while at the same time, we're finishing the development and hopefully test flights of the launch vehicles to carry humans. Uh, the gateway we're talking about is not Space Station 2.0. It is a much, much, much more modest facility. Um, in fact, some people often get confused. I think I was initially. So there's the Orion. That's the lander. The gateway is just this little thing here. Power and propulsion element, little docking module, the lander itself, the Orion. Now, the reason you're doing this is the service module on the Orion being provided by Europe, uh, frankly, is underpowered. Uh, it is not, doesn't have the kind of Delta V capability to it that we had on the service module on Apollo, which allowed you to go very deep in the lunar gravity well, basically about 100 kilometer orbit. The amount of power we have on this, because it was originally built for an asteroid rendezvous mission, which we're now repurposing, uh, we wind up going very high in the gravity well, so, and then having a transfer, transfer vehicle take us down to the surface and back. Uh, so it is, it looks a little similar to Apollo, but it's a bit different uh, because with this gateway facility, which by the way, with a solar propulsion, we can maneuver to different location points. So basically all of the moon is accessible depending on where we position the gateway over time. So you can basically drift the facility wherever you need to do it. So if you want to do an equatorial campaign or different polar campaigns, you can maneuver that gateway around to wherever you need to go. 
um, and then you're docking with that coming back and forth and the surface module goes from that gateway and it's a pretty pretty consistent delta V requirement. Now in putting this all this up we're going to be using a mixture of vehicles so we have uh, a number of commercial vehicles as well as the space launch system. Uh, the first power and propulsion elements going up on commercial vehicles. So essentially it's an all of the above strategy. We're using the SLS for things that we absolutely have to do like the very heavy Orion and we're using commercial vehicles to put up the smaller pieces uh, where we can. Going to the South Pole of the Moon, as I mentioned, there's a couple of different sites that are of interest. Um, you know, you can have all kinds of nice things like long duration access to sunlight, Earth communication and all that. But really the business about um, looking into the permanently shadowed regions uh, where we will probably need small nuclear power sources for rovers and other things going in. There's some things you can do with solar, but again, nuclear power sources are a longer term need uh, for going to permanently shadowed regions small compact nuclear reactor for the lunar surface operations, which you will, of course, absolutely need for Mars. You could probably do without it for the moon, uh, but it really helps. The point about these kind of operations, having habitat modules, nuclear power, communication systems, uh, is to really use the moon as a proving ground to do all of those things that you eventually would need to do to Mars. Now, one of the things you won't be able to do on the moon for Mars is uh, very heavy entry, descent, and landing. So, the Mars rover 2020 is about one metric ton. The designs for most human Mars landers are like 30 metric tons. Um, so we really don't have an assured way we know of how to get something that heavy down to the, lunar sur down to the Martian surface in a practical way. So that's kind of a Mars unique kind of function. But pretty much everything else are things that we can and should be able to test closer to home. Again, in an analogy to Gemini, uh, going in and doing things uh, all the different pieces you need to do before you then engage in the Apollo level of effort. And what I'd like to end with um, is, uh, is a chart about questions. If you go back to Kennedy's uh, question about where can we beat the Soviets, is there anything we can do, how do we catch up, and so forth. And we know that in doing decadal science surveys, um, astrophysics community, uh, planetary science community, they ask very simple questions like, is there life elsewhere in the universe? How did the universe form? Where did it go? Very simple, profound questions that, of course, have long, complicated answers. There's really nothing quite like that for human spaceflight. Again, as I said, most times we've done human spaceflight have been for political, uh, geopolitical kinds of reasons, and I contend we still do that today. But if I try to ask maybe a, a non-political question, you know, a motivational sort of question, uh, the one I've come up with, um, uh, inspired by a guy named Harry Shippen, who wrote a book on humans in space uh, that I modified this from, um, is to say that do humans have a future in space? And if the answer, question is kind of like intelligent life in the universe. The answer is either yes or no. I mean, it's, it's a binary choice, and either answer is actually rather profound. Either we have a future off the planet, or are we, this is where we will always be. Uh, both are, in fact, possible. Uh, people, I think, sometimes have what I would call a faith-based answer, that of course we're going to expand in the universe, or of course we're always going to have to be here. Um, we don't really know. If you break that down into two subparts, uh, can you live off the land, that is, can you, or do you have to haul everything from Earth? Or and is there anything economically useful to do, or do you always depend on the taxpayer or somebody else to pay your way? If the answer to both those questions is yes, you can live off the land and you can find something economically useful to do, you get the science fiction vision. You get you know, space settlements. If the answer is no, then space is some form of Mount Everest. You, know, you go there, you climb, it's symbolic and inspiring, take pictures, but nobody lives there. It's not, a, not really a place of human habitation. If you can use local resources to operate, but you're really dependent upon somebody else to be there, you could add maybe tourism for Antarctica. Um, it's like Antarctica. You have a field station, uh, McMurdo or the South Pole facility. You do science, you go there, you're permanently occupied, you're doing things. But again, it's not something that's a self-sustaining community, uh, the way we might think of a settlement. If you can't live off the land, but there's something useful to do, mining the lunar surface or asteroids for some other reason. It's kind of like a North Sea oil platform. You go out there, it's a highly dangerous environment, it's expensive, but you do it because there's an economic return. But again, you're always coming back to Earth. We don't really know which one of these things, outcomes, very profoundly different is the outcome. The point, in my view, of exploration is to be able to answer this question of what are the future of humans in space by exploration that helps us answer, can we live off the land? Can we do something out there? 
And that frontier of what's technically possible, what's economically possible, changes. Uh, what used to be a regime that was only accessible by governments is now accessible by industry. As that frontier expands, can it expand? We don't know. Uh, we're going to be able to answer these kinds of questions. Three of those four outcomes have humans in space in some form. And my contention is that I would like the United States and the values it represents, respect for rule of law, democracy, human rights, mixed market economies, all these things are part of that frontier. There are going to be other countries that are out there as well who don't share all of those ideals. And that's fine, but I don't want them there without us. I want to make sure that the values that we represent, that our societies represent, or at least try to represent, are part of that human future in space, which is one of, I think, will be the legacies of Apollo. Right, thank you very much. Take questions. <laughs>